Thank you. J just a word to, to explain this conference and this uh, public lecture uh, today. So the conference, uh, it's part of the Euro uh, European project called Graphist. It's on the inscriptions and graffiti in Latin alphabet in the Eastern Mediterranean during the Middle Ages. So 10 centuries, 10 countries, and a team of almost more or less 10 people to, to do this during five years. We started uh, last year, and it's uh, the second uh, conference. And this conference was dedicated precisely to the graphic signs of the Nativity Church in Bethlehem. So not only the graffiti and the inscriptions, but also the heraldry, the coats of arms, and the iconographic signs, of course. And today I'm very pleased and honored to welcome Michele Bacci. Michele is a former student of the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Pisa, and he is now professor of medieval art history at the University of Fribourg in Switzerland. His research activity has been dedicated to the study of the different function of images, objects, and religious space, places in an intercultural perspective, and to the analysis of the dynamics of artistic interaction in the Mediterranean context in the Middle Ages and the modern period, from Venice, Crete, Crete Cyprus, Holy Land. His bibliography has more than 200 uh, titles, so I won't explain all the titles. I will simply mention some books of the last years. The Many, uh, the Many Faces of Christ, portraying the Holy in the East and the West, from uh, the 4th century to the 14th century. Of course, The Mystic Cave, her history of the Nativity Church in Bethlehem. And Michele was a member of the International Consortium team for the restoration of the Nativity Church. So he knows the Basilica better than anyone else, as you will see. And the three books published in 2021, so last year, on the Veneto-Byzantine interaction in icon painting. And for a wider audience, Le Vie del Mediterraneo, Icone tra Venezia e Bizanzio. And the last book, also connected with the Nativity Church, is the publication of a manuscript of Vicente Juras, Pinturas y Grafitos, from the Basilica. So I think I have to stop, and now it's better to hear uh, Michele. Thank you once again, Michele. The floor is yours. I would like to thank uh, the, the, uh, all the organizers, so the Ecole Biblique uh, and Estelle for, his, uh, for her kind words. Uh, I'm, my, my speech will be extremely emotion laden. I mean, the idea of speaking in Jerusalem, in the Holy Land about Bethlehem is something I ne never experienced before. So, and I have to say that generally speaking about Bethlehem is for me a very demanding task, engaging me not only on the scholarly, but also on the personal level. For uh, a decade, I have been involved as the only art historian among a plethora of technical experts in the restoration works of the Nativity Church promoted by the Palestinian National Authority with the approval of the th and support of the three Christian communities that, that own and take care of the building. There's the Greek Orthodox, the Apostolic Armenians, and the Catholics represented by the Franciscan custody of the Holy Land. So um, after centuries of fight and rivalries between these Christian groups for the hegemony in the holy site of Bethlehem, the late Ottoman government decided in 1852 to establish the status quo, which meant that each group was granted the possession of specific parts of the church and its annexes, 
and allowed to perform specific rituals before the holy spots according to precise regulations. It was de facto impossible to make repairs and introduce new decors. The stalemate froze the place in its mid-19th century state. Almost nothing has been changed, or at least nothing has been significantly changed since then and up to, to um, um, 2010, despite serious damage in the roof, which caused the church to be flooded with, with water during rainy days. Um, the restoration works not only prevented the building from, no, sorry, this is not the right, uh, okay. The restoration works not only prevented the building from the serious risks uh, which uh, uh, had motivated its inscription in the UNESCO list of world heritage in danger, but also enabled us to significantly improve our knowledge of its history and art. The rediscovery of a full-length mosaic angel is certainly the most obvious outcome which found an echo in the media. But more generally, the cleaning of the wall mosaics, the column paintings, and the floor mosaic, as well as many more actions that were made possible by the restoration works, opened an extraordinary opportunity to study the monument as a whole. As to myself, I was given the difficult task of that of assisting the restorers in some of their decisions, that, which implied that the, I had to gather all possible sources about the history of the building, a great many of which consisted in pilgrims' travelogues, guidebooks, and treatises on the sanctity of the Holy Land, written in a wide spectrum of languages and dating from late antiquity to the 12th century. The restoration works, which came to an end, uh, no, which n never really came to an end, but the, let's say that these are stalemates since 2020, um, are detailed in a recent book edited by the project coordinator, uh, Claudio Alessandri of Ferrara University, whereas the outcomes of my own research have been published in a 12, uh, 2017 book under the title, The Mystic Cave. Please don't be worried, I'm not going to repeat what I have already, already written. Uh, I would rather offer comments on some new evidence that emerged in these last years. Nevertheless, for the sake of clarity, I will sketchily evoke the main difficulties, general questions, and intellectual conundrums one is confronted with when studying the Bethlehem church. First, it must be stressed that it is not, that Bethlehem is not just a, a church. No, this is obviously obvious, but not always uh, thought of. No, it's a very special place belonging to a wider network of holy sites that define the status of exceptionality attributed to Palestine by Jews, Christians, and Muslims. So located about nine kilometers to the south of Jerusalem, Bethlehem is an obvious goal for pilgrims since at least the third century AD. This means that up to our days, visitors to Bethlehem have been more religiously than aesthetically motivated. It's obvious. Uh, they normally go straight to the south transit where they gather uh, before entering the tiny space of the Holy Grotto where the incarnated Son of God is, uh, is reported to have come to light. The focus of their visual and sensorial experience is not a space with its architectural dimension, but rather a spot not larger than a hole in the ground. All that stays, uh, all that stays around this hole is at the end nothing more than a sumptuous, splendid, monumental frame, including precious marble slabs, lamps and candles, veils and hangings, glittering mosaics, hooden carvings, and architectural structures. Before, so you see here the, uh, the hall huh, of the Nativity Grotto. Before the restoration, it was hard to imagine how magnificent this frame may have looked like. This picture was made, uh, which you see here, was made during my first visit to Bethlehem in 2009 in the company of the late regretted scholar Gustav Kuhnel. 
the interior still retained the unassumed appearance it was given by the last recorded restorations from uh, 1842. The mosaics, once covering the whole of the, of the upper walls, were reduced to small squares emerging out of a light gray plastering. And they were so dark to prevent any analysis uh, of, or appreciation. Uh, the same could be said, sorry. I don't know what happens to me with my, with my PowerPoint. Anyway, it will leave it here. Yeah, okay. Um, the same could be said of the column paintings, which had suffered as well from the destructive action of candle smoke. By the way, the problems of the basilica were far from new. Uh, water infiltrations, which caused the detachment of mosaics, are first documented in 1280, and they never stopped. In the 16th century, the same mosaics were among the preferred targets for the arquebuses of Ottoman soldiers, a great many, a great many bullets were found on their surface during the restoration. A late 18th century French visitor rightly observed that these images were going very quickly to turn into mysteries because of their extremely fragmentary state. Their cleaning restored their glittering, multicolored appearance and rediscovered whole portions of mosaics that had been concealed in 1842. So this is the smoke of candles, and here you see before and after the restoration. Um, one of them, one of these um, portions of mosaic, have been part of the plant standing close to St. Peter in the transfiguration of the South Transit, reappeared before my eyes on June 26, 2015. It was one of the most exciting experiences in my life. And despite their fragmentary state, we can now have an idea of the effect that such mosaics and the many decors of the building could have ha had on their ancient viewers. Let me now summarize the new evidence we got from the restorations as to the different historical phases undergone by the building. The most mysterious moment in the history of the church is undoubtedly the Constantinian one. Even if there are some records of um, the history of the church, uh, sorry, even if there are some records of some cultic phenomenon already established in Bethlehem in the third century, it was on the initiative of Emperor Constantine and his mother Helena that the Nativity Church was erected as a memorial building marking the site of Christ's birth in the same moment, the 330s, as the Holy Sepulchre and the Eliona churches were built. The excavations made by the British for some months in 1934 made clear that the structure consisted of a wide atrium, a five-aisled nave, and an octagonal eastern end whose precise function has never been fully understood and probably will never and until somebody will be authorized to make archaeological sounding, extensive archaeological soundings in the choir and the south transept. The British also rediscovered large portions of floor mosaic in the north transept and the nave, the latter's cleaning that took place last year enabled the archaeologist Alessandro Fichera to make excavations in the nearby areas here marked in green, which provide us now with new elements. We can now better appreciate these mosaics, which have been basically interpreted only in the past on stylistic grounds. They have been mostly described as abstract, geometric, and strongly stylized, uh, and a fifth century date has been proposed for them based on the assumption that their surface should not exactly correspond to the Constantinian floor level. This hypothesis contrasts with the rendering of some details, such as this bird, for example, in a distinctively naturalistic way, and seems to be contradicted by the outcomes of Fichera's work 
which provided us with a hitherto missing stratigraphic survey and made clear that the foundations of the present-day 6th century building were laid directly over the 4th century pavement. Indeed, the fragment of an earlier mosaic floor was found at much lower depth than the Constantinian floor. This indicates in any instance that buildings were present close to the Holy Cave already before the construction of the first church. The scientific analysis made possible by the restorations that removed all doubts as to the dating and early history of the present building. Traditionally, scholars have been suspicious of the story reported by Patriarch Eutychius of Alexandria in the 10th century, according to which the Nativity Church would have been burned and destroyed during the Samaritan Revolt in 529 and reconstructed in 531 by order of Byzantine Emperor Justinian, who, being unsatisfied of its tiny dimensions, would have sentenced the architect to death and made it build again. The doubts uh, were increased by Procopius' silence of the church in his De, De Edificis. Furthermore, two uh, curvilinear walls discovered by the British under the northern and south apses seemed to corroborate the hypothesis of an intermediary phase. Accordingly, it has even been suggested that the transept zone may date from the Crusader period. Um, the, these hypotheses um, can now be safely ruled out on different grounds. The archaeometrical survey made in 2010 did not evidence any discontinuity in the masonry between the transepts and nave. The overall measures of the building indicate that the base unit was the Byzantine foot used in the 6th century. Third, the triconch structure with apses on both transepts being mentioned in the 7th century by Patriarch Sophronius and in the 11th by the late Imperial Jacinthus measures uh, 35.81 meter in length, which corresponds very closely to the 23 dextry indicated by Charlemagne's envoys in 808. And for the, sorry, The radiocarbon and dendrochronological analysis of the wooden beams embedded into the church walls in both the nave and the eastern end indicated a time span between 545 and 665. Basing on this data, I formulated the hypothesis that the building may have been erected by Justinian after the earthquake of 551 or as a consequence of the new Samaritan insurrection in 556. The works may have started in the 560s and lasted after the emperor's death in 565. The new building was significantly different from the previous one. The nave was lengthened by one bay and the octagon associated in Palestine with many important holy places was substituted by a midway solution between a cross-shaped transept and a trifoil-shaped building was attributed to the eastern end. Many efforts were made to provide the building with extraordinary ornaments. The Mizzi Ahmar, a red stone being a local type of Dolomitic rock used also in the Jerusalem Nea church and never quarried again before the 19th century, was used for the columns. Capitals were not the same we are accustomed to associate with Justinian's times, or at least with Justinian's art in Constantinople. And the radical corresponded to a variant of, a, of Corinthian capital well-rooted in Palestinian habits and including some distinctive features, a triangular element between the helices, lilied motifs on the upper edge, and smooth, undecorated stalks. Similarities, as here you see these elements. Similarities can be detected with the columns in the Jerusalem Cardo Maximus, which are nevertheless more stylized. 
In the past, defenders of a Constantinian dating of the building or of its allegedly retrospective forms described the nave as consisting of trabeated colonnades. This was largely due to the fact that in a later period, the low relieving arches that be bear the weight of the upper walls were walled up and hidden below the plastering. The restorations made visible some of them and cleaned the wooden lintels embedded in them. They are embellished with vegetal friezes, globular motifs, and bands of rosettes. In Justinian's times, nobody could have noticed that such architraves were made in a material other than the one used for the columns and capitals, since Bath had a golden, shining appearance. Traces of gilding were found on both marble and wooden elements. This enables us to understand that the glittering effect of the church interior evoked in Patria Sophronius's Anacreontics was not just the fruit of rhetorical exaggeration. Um, okay, I don't know. Okay, let's see. According to Sophronius, the interaction of gilded surfaces mosaics and the ceiling twinkling like stars contributed to arouse the viewer's astonishment. Something of such precious decors was still well detectable in the 11th century as Jacinth visited the church and was especially struck by the beauty of its marble revetments on both the walls and the floor. We can figure out that in Byzantine times the church may have looked like the interior of Jerusalem's Dome of the Rock, whose marble slabs may have partly come from Bethlehem, if we are to believe some 16th century sources reporting that Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent ordered them to be removed from the church and employed in the Haram. Such slabs were constantly praised by pilgrims as one of the most stunning ornaments of the Basilica, and many judged, judged them more impressive than the mosaics. Traces of their removal that began already in Mamluk times, can still be seen on the nave walls. Nevertheless, one remnant of this pavement can perhaps still be seen on the floor. It is located in the middle of the central nave and is marked with a circle of black stone in its very center. In such location, the 14th century pilgrim Niccolò da Poggibonzi was still able to see a colonnade topped with a globe, which I think should be intended as Stavrodochos, a support for a big, big size metal cross. Such cross stands located in Medio Ecclesiae were frequent in the setting of early Byzantine churches and are paralleled in their function by the so called pre altar crosses preserved in the Caucasian region of Svanetti, here, La Gurka near uh, And it can be wondered whether the monumental Crux Gemata displayed in the Crusader wall paintings that is also located in the middle of the church on the north wall may have been inspired by a monumental cross in uh, the church space as Champini's engraving shows it stood over a globe like the one described by Poggi Bonzi. Jacinthus's 11th century description provides precious data about the eastern end which can be compared with the evidence provided by archaeological excavations. The altar was located on an elevated podium provided with side doors and flights of steps uh, leading to the underground grotto. It, it can be assumed that this structure included a templum separating it from the nave, but uh, the uh, hypothesis that this may have been made of bronze and that its door may be identified with those located at the northern and southern entrances to the cave can now mm, be ruled out. St. Jacinthus states very clearly that they were already at their present place. Another precious information concerns the presence of a choir screen that was uh, directly connected to a well the letter was the famous Well of the Star, already mentioned by Gregory of Tours in the 6th century, where the pure-hearted could see the star of Bethlehem miraculously floating in its waters. The British excavations uh, revealed 
um, its foundations, and since the measurements corresponded, roughly corresponded, they proposed that the latter may have been the octagonal baptistry now located in the south nave. Investigations on this baptistry um, took place in the summer of 2019. They made clear that since its very beginnings, this was intended as a font. It is made of a whole block of Midzi Hachmar and corresponds to the type um, known in scholarship as monolith qu quarterfoil, although it stands out for its four-lobed design. Even more astonishingly, astonishingly, as in a kind of matryoshka, a smaller font was found inside. After a close inspection, I was able to determine that it was a capital whose abacus had been cut off, whereas its calathos had been hollowed out and provided with a hole for the evacuation of water. Its general shape corresponded to the bowl type or basket type favored in late 6th to 7th century architecture in Palestine. I could also determine that its double frieze of acanthus rolls springing out of a vase with three pointed leaves housing crosses, four petal rosettes, and whirling wheels were used in late Byzantine and early Islamic decorations. Indeed, the Bethlehem capital is identical to one preserved in the Islamic Museum on Jerusalem's Haram al Sharif originally used in a church and later re-employed in one of the buildings on the Esplanade. Since the Crusaders are known to have used spolia from the Aram, I tend to imagine that they may have also been responsible for transforming this capital into a font. In their times, the baptism of adults had become thoroughly obsolete and the smaller structure was far more indicated for the performance of the rite. It can be wondered what happened in Bethlehem during the first period of Islamic rule during the 7th and the late 11th century. The sources, the available sources are not many and above all, far from clear. But in general terms, it can be assumed that the building did not suffer from destructions or damage. Some 9th century texts hint at Justinian's mosaic decoration as being still extant and this is confirmed by Jacinthus in the 11th century and the Russian pilgrim Daniel in the early 12th. At least they were not thoroughly destroyed, especially in the apsis on the eastern end, since Jacinthus specifies that the latter were still thoroughly decorated. In the past, scholars like Henri Stern had assumed that at least part of the nave mosaics may have been made in the 8th century on account of their affinities with the decors in the doom of the rock. It is self-evident that the two cycles are interrelated. Both make use of vegetal scrolls, but a closer inspection reveals many dissimilarities. For example, those in Bethlehem have leaves of different colors and house animals and objects, whereas those in Jerusalem are homogeneously green. The fantastic plants separating the buildings of the church councils are associated with the Doom of the Rock, but perhaps even more with the mosaics of the Al-Aqsa Mosque, even if they differ in their chromatic palette and in a number of details. The technical investigations made by Susanna Sarmati and Marcello Piacenti on the mosaic surface, and Marco Verità, I should also mention, showed that it was made in the same moment, in the same technique, and by making use of the same materials. So the chemical analysis made by Verità on the glasses tesserae revealed that if some of them cannot be earlier than the 12th century, the blue ones can only date from Byzantine times. This means that the makers of the Crusader cycle made use of tesserae belonging to earlier mosaics. On account of this, it can be wondered whether they took inspiration from either the monuments on, of the Aram, which they regarded as Solomon's temple and palace, or perhaps also from some extant mosaics that were still visible 
in the 12th century in the church. Another question follows, were these the mosaics from Justinian's times or maybe other interventions dating from a later period? The question is legitimate um, since we know from Patriarch Eutychius of Alexandria that at least one decoration campaign took place sometimes in the late 9th or 10th century. At some time, the South Apse was appropriated by the Muslims and used as a, as a Qibla, indicating the direction of prayer. And like the Holy Sepulchre, the site of nativity was also worshipped by Muslim believers. The mosaics in the conch, which were probably fi figural, were erased and substituted with inscriptions. Since Jacinthus later states that all apses were decorated with mosaics, it can be supposed that decorations of a more Islamic type looking like the monumental inscriptions and vegetal scrolls using the doom of the rock were displayed in the south transept. Be this as it may, uh, for the crusaders, the exuberant decors displayed in their mosaic contributed to stress the role of Bethlehem, the place elected by Christ as his first earthly dwelling as a new temple that is a new house of God. Nevertheless, it is striking to remark that the decision to revert the upper walls of the building with an, with an uninterrupted glittering surface came only relatively late in the 1160s under the very special circumstances of a kind of joint venture between the Bishop of Bethlehem, Ralph, the King of Jerusalem, Amoric, and the Byzantine Emperor, Manuel Comnenos, who was also the main financial sponsor. I have no time to describe this, the cycle in depth. Let it suffice to say that, ah, sorry. Okay, there is a kind of mistake in my, in, in my, okay. Okay, I don't know what happened, okay. Okay, let us suffice to say that the mosaics were made by a team of artists coordinated by a master named Ephraim, who, unlike his Byzantine colleagues, was self-confident enough to display his name and professional skills as a painter a mosaicist in the Greek inscription in the Bima without any formula of self-denigration and therefore the names of political authorities. In so doing, he was perhaps closer to the behavior of Islamic artists who like Abdallah the Egyptian in the Al-Aqsa tomb from um, 1035 had recorded their name and professional qualities in monumental inscriptions. Another aspect I would like to stress is, and now, sorry, I have to get back. I don't know what happened. Another aspect I would like to stress is the kinetic dimension of the program. The mosaics were made suitable to be read by pilgrims who went through the church nave, entered the cave, for the south transept and came out from the northern flight of steps ending in the north transept. The pilgrim's movement was paralleled by that or lined eh, by that of the angels on the upper layer of the nave walls who are shown moving toward the Virgin Mary in the main apse. As his double Latin and Syriac signature indicates, a local Christian Arab painter named Basil was responsible for the decoration of this area. The underlying church councils were the outcome of a visual compromise between the constitutes of the Latin and Greek Melkite churches. And its general meaning was to lay emphasis on the church as an institution and its corporate supra-individual responsibility, in other words, on the ecclesia as a new temple of God. As already mentioned, this connection with temple symbolism was reinforced by vegetal decorations. On its turn, the lower layer of mosaics laid emphasis on the genealogies of Christ, thus celebrating the role of Bethlehem as the connection point between the Old and New Testaments. Um, once in the south transit, visitors were reminded of the major events in Christ's uh, 
public life. Then they enter the cave with the nativity mosaic visualizing the event commemorated in the very place where it was reported to have taken place. This mosaic was not isolated since several sources record the presence of similar deckers in the cave vault. Quite possibly, they may have been stories of Christ's infancies. Once in the northern transept, oriented toward Jerusalem, pilgrims were encouraged to meditate on the Lord's passion and resurrection, even if only the incredulity and the ascensions are preserved. We know from a 16th century description that the monumental crucifixion was displayed on the western wall. That is, it was the image that visitors coming out of the cave would immediately see. And so this leads us to a question I would like to approach now, if I find the slide to, uh, yeah, here you see some details of the mosaics uh, and uh, here the transept, the south transept, the cave and what, what is left of the decoration in the north transept. So if we keep in mind that there was a crucifixion, a monumental mosaic crucifixion in the north transept, uh, we have to uh, wonder and pose a question that has never been posed. Since the remnants of another crucifixion made in the medium of mural painting can still be seen on the southwestern pillar of the Bima, we should wonder how the same subject could be represented twice in, the, in approximately the same space. The question is important since it offers some new perspective as to the role of the painted program that decorated the church prior to the making of the mosaic cycle. It is well known that the basilica, starting from 1130 at least, was embellished with mural paintings, but scholarship has hitherto stressed that it consisted of iconic rather than narrative images. They were displayed on the columns, eh, which we have seen before, especially in the central nave, and included saints worshipped in different parts of the medieval world, thus reflecting the international origins of their sponsors. So, let's get back uh, to these images, if I manage. And many thanks for your patience. So, the votive functions of such images are now perhaps easier uh, to grasp thanks to the restored visibility of the accompanying inscriptions. And we have been speaking about this for, for three days, actually. So, uh, but I will just uh, again uh, um, uh, mention the, this, this aspect. Um, so you see saints belonging to different areas of the world and which were not necessarily united by a, an iconographic program. But in any case, uh, um, Saint Theodosius was made for the spiritual sake of a Greek donor, as the inscription indicates. Saint, um, um, Saint, um, um, Saint Olaf of Norway for a Norwegian Men, I spoke about this in my presentation yesterday, and St. James the Great for two Western pilgrims who had also been in Santiago of Compostela were proud of having united the, the two holy places where St. James was venerated through and in their bodies. The restorations made possible a closer reading of the inscriptions included in the image of the Virgin Glicophilusa, or oh, Heavenly Mother, says a knight with his wife and daughter kneeling on the lower edge, grants solace to the needy. The Virgin supplicates her son on their behalf. O oh, my son, who are the true God, I implore you to be merciful with these people. Christ answers, all existing good things are with you, meaning that the sins of the supplicants will be forgiven. So it is evident at least for, that at least in, the, in a first moment, such images were not conceived of as part of a larger program, but rather 
as the outcomes of individual initiatives. Nevertheless, thanks to the restorations, we can safely conclude that the church decors already included sequences of narrative scenes. And let me go back now to the remnants of um, uh, painted scenes that were found under the plastering in the lower walls of the southern transept, close to the Greek altar, the present-day Greek altar of St. Nicholas. Okay. It is still possible to detect an architecture, the half figure of an angel, and a loricated cuirass. Uh, since the area was located over the access to the northern caves that were identified in the 12th century with the burial site of the Holy Innocents, it is possible that the latter's massacre ordered by Herod was represented there. Finally, um, there is a partially preserved crucifixion on the southwestern pillar of the Bima, which was also the last in the northern colonnade of the central nave. Since all columns were gradually decorated with images of saints, it was decided at some time to conclude the sequence with a similar figure on the pillar. Nevertheless, this was displayed at a much lower height if compared to the others, since the surface was already filled with another narrative painting. The lating uh, abbreviation uh, CXO, meaning crucifixio, leaves no doubts as to the identification of the scene. Still well visible are the pious women, labeled in Greek as Mary, mother of James, Salome, and Mary Magdalene, the Virgin, uh, whereas only, um, and the Virgin, only the left part of John's body is still detectable. What uh, we still see is enough to acknowledge that the composition stood out for strongly outlined contours, zigzag shaped edges, and voluminous figures, and lacked all those dynamic elements associated with the later phase of communion painting, such as V shaped folds and fluttering hems. Such features as the drop shaped fold on Mary's shoulder on, or John's contrapposto posture seem to indicate an earlier dating in the second quarter of the 12th century. Albeit unusual, the representation of John close to the women is paralleled by the solution used at Abu Ghosh and may have been inspired by the now lost image displayed in the Golgotha Chapel of Jerusalem's Holy Sepulchre in Crusader times. This implies that the composition also um, occupy the other faces of the pillar, which was therefore meant to be circumambulated. Most likely, Christ on the cross was shown on the eastern face, whereas the northern one may have displayed the centurion, the Roman soldiers, and the Pharisees. An Arabic inscription carved on the lower part of the pillar confirms that it was originally accessible. The epigraphic quality seemed to corroborate at 10th or 11th century dating. Nevertheless, at some moment, the pillar was incorporated into a wider structure and disclosed the loss of the crucifixion scene. When exactly this took place is hard to say. The reconstruction of the chancel screen made uh, by the British and based on archaeological evidence shows that there was a narrow space interposed uh, between um, between the podium and the pillar. It is known that the, crusades, the crusaders reshaped the area to make it suitable for the Latin rite by moving the altar further east and reserving the space for the choir stalls. Its general shape can be understood from a number of late 16th to 17th century plans and is described by Niccolò da Poggibonzi as a wall with one main and two side entrances that is from both the nave and the transepts, probably. At the end of the nave, it looked much more as a thick walled western tramezzo than as a Byzantine temple. It can be clearly seen in Bernab Bernardino Amico's uh, um, uh, 1609 elevation. It was a thick wall directly leaning on the northern pillars that thoroughly closed the choir and separated it from the nave. 
but it is probable that it had been by then reinforced and extended to encompass even the side aisles. In 1917, this impassable barrier uh, was partially destroyed by order of the military governor of Jerusalem, Sir Ronald Storrs, who deemed it to be a thoroughly 19th century addition. It can be assumed that the crucifixion was damaged and partly obliterated um, uh, with the rearrangement of the choir space. It is less clear whether the buttressing of the pillar took place in the 12th century or later when the wall was enlarged. Nevertheless, there are some grounds, sorry, <laughs> sorry, it will arrive, but uh, it is, uh, I'm moving my fingers without knowing what I'm doing, so sorry. Okay, let's leave this slide. Um, nevertheless, there are some grounds to assume that the area was significantly changed in Frankish times. Around 1130, the body of Joseph of Arimathea was rediscovered and brought to Bethlehem. By the times of Theodoric's visit in circa 1170, it had been set into the wall of a double vaulted chapel located somewhere close to the choir. Even if the pilgrim does not give further details, it is logical to think that the relic of such a prominent witness of Christ's passion may have been set on display in the area where the crucifixion scene was to be seen. The mosaic program that replaced the mural painting manifested this connection in a much more sumptuous, monumental, and efficacious way. Thank you for your attention and your passions.